Hello, everyone. Welcome to Quantum Catechesis. I'm Father Joe Krupp, and you are not. And today, today, today is Thursday, August 31st, the year of our Lord, 20 some 23, 2023. I was so proud of myself for getting August 31st right that I messed everything up. I forgot the year. That's what happened, and you're going to, I don't know. I was trying to say something funny. Uh, so today we're going to continue looking at the war in Japan or the war in the Pacific and <clears throat> sorry, all of this history to get us to looking at the decision to drop the atomic bomb twice on the empire of Japan in 1945. And what I hope, 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 hope is that this helps us look at uh, that decision in its context, because again, uh, it, it's super easy for us in our comfortable little worlds with our iPhones and all of this to uh, shame people or to say that was a terrible decision. And maybe we're right, but if we're right, it's dumb luck uh, because we really need to know this situation. And just before the show came on, uh, I think it was Carrie pointing out that she talked to a young person today who watched Oppenheimer and just had no idea. And there's a part of me, and I know this is probably just part of getting older, where you're like, how do you not know that? How do you not know? Like, I knew when I was a kid uh, that, that about the building of the bomb, the Manhattan Project, and Los Alamos, and, and all the drama, and that we were racing the Nazis, right, to see who can get, someone's going to build that. It's who's going to get there first. And I, I just didn't know. But uh, I think it goes back to that thing I, I talked about some time ago, where if you look at us now, in some ways we're smarter than any generation that's come before us, and in some way we're, we're dumber. And a great way to think of it is people uh, really, even in uh, till our recent history, may not have had a wide range of knowledge, but what they knew, they knew, they, they were like a, a puddle that's 12 feet deep. Whereas now what we know is this 12 mile around lake that's an inch deep, right? And I'm not saying one's better than the other, but uh, it's just, we have so much we can know now and knowledge comes at absolutely no price, which is why we've lost respect for it. Um that uh, it's really changed a lot, you know. I, I, I Little tangent, little tangent. Yeah. You know, I was, I think, I guess, Gen Xers, we were the last people to have to work for information, yeah. right? That uh, I always use this image, and, it, and it's dead serious. I remember asking Dad about Jackie Robinson when I was a boy, and um, that the answer was, for me to get on my bike and pedal, I don't know, what was it, four miles to the library, Dad? Five miles? Which was fun. Obviously, when you're a kid, oh, please. And then you go in the library, you go to the card catalog, you go, it was a lot of work. And then you just got unsorted information. You, you, you sorted, you wrote things down, you tried to memorize them, uh, and then you pedaled five miles back home. And that was the norm, right? This is why, like, think about this. There were people who made a living going door to door selling encyclopedias, right? Think about that. It's, it's crazy. Um, but one thing it gave you, and not because of virtue, but just because of how it is, it had value then. The knowledge you had had value. Truth had value because you worked for it. Whereas now, like Chuck and I just did this, he was helping me with the next, probably next show, and I was asking him to get me numbers on Japan's population in different years. And what would it take you, 10 seconds per question? Okay, Chuck, what was Japan's population this year? What was it this year? And he's just, bam, 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 not because he knew it. But what that ends up happening, what ends up happening is when something's ubiquitous, we don't really have much respect for it. It's why giving out money is basically always a long-term disaster, right? Because nobody worked for it. 
or the people who worked for it, you don't know. Does this make sense? Um, but so at the same time, and I'm going to be bold here, it hasn't reduced – our reverence for truth is gone, right? We just don't care about truth. Uh, <laughs> but our arrogance has got worse. The fact that I don't know what I'm talking about doesn't seem to slow me down at all. Yeah. Uh, like, uh, it was funny. Some guy uh, wrote a thing on Facebook, and I was on one of my little Tiger fan pages on Facebook. And this guy, and at first I, th I thought he was joking. But he wrote, Riley Green is a terrible baseball player, and the Tigers need to cut him. So I reply, you know, ha, ha, ha. You know, I think, oh, that's a riot. I mean, it's just, oh, no. No, he was serious. And, like, started talking about how many strike how many times he struck out and i'm like bro I, I, you know each a row struck out it happens and if it happens seven out of ten times you're one of the greatest hitters of ever, that ever existed right but anyway sorry i'm getting on a tangent so we have a lot of people who have strong opinions on whether we should have dropped the bomb but it's all based on this bad things happen to japanese people when we drop the atomic bomb yeah War does that to people. Are we aware Japan had the least amount of civilian casualties of any countries that participated in this in World War II? Are we aware it's not even close? Are we aware we were doing l bombing nobody gripes about before that called firebombing that was grotesque and shocking? Uh, and we'll, we'll get into this. But many of you who might have heard strong opinions from people on atomic bomb might not have heard them talk about how we were bombing them before that. Yeah. Oh, there's a question. Okay, sorry, sis. Uh, let's get up there. Do, 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 do. That's my uh, theme music. Have you seen the movie Oppenheimer? I did. Uh, dad, I think, Dad, we went, right? Um, and obviously I was prepared. I, I read a review like because I don't... Uh, <laughs> I hope this will kind of shine. You know, like when I read reviews and it says there's a shocking amount of violence, that only makes me want to see it more, right? But when they're like, there's some uh, how you doing in there, I don't want anything to do with that because I can watch violence all day and not inflict any. Uh, so there was a review that's a Christian review that was like, there's a point and it's not subtle. Uh, you know, so... I have my avert your eyes ready, right? You avert your eyes. Do you know this one? It's where you, you just suddenly find great interest in the theater's ceiling and the architecture. Why, Father, look at the way they structured those bricks. Um, so there is a hellacious scene in there. But truly, again, as soon as I saw, they warn you, uh, I started checking out the architecture of the theater. Okay. Yeah. The, the young person that I talked to very much likes that actress that was nude and oh yeah she, well she said she's in the movie four times and she's nude each time but had very few lines okay was there any value to the character i think in the sense that it showed he um like Hoppenheimer's a complicated dude uh he and his wife were both just messed up people who actually deeply loved each other well, they were deeply committed to each other, but she was, it wasn't, I don't want to say she was fine with his dalliances as they called them back then, but she didn't really fight it either. Okay. I, I don't know how to explain it. So I do think you can show somebody's character flaws, like uh, in sin of infidelity without going, no, really, it's sex, look, right? You know, I, I there's ways, there's an art to, to subtlety, um, which we just don't grasp. Okay, so do you feel going into the movie, it was written with a certain expectation of knowledge of everything, and it was just a deep I think so. It? I think, like, if you go to watch it without knowing anything about it, you'll do fine-ish, but it's a classic Christopher Nolan. He doesn't tell the story in order yeah. at all. Uh, and it might even be unclear to you. you got to keep track of people's clothes. That's what I figured out. That was the way I could figure out what was pre-World War II 
during World War II and post-World War II because it's not in order. Right, Christopher Nolan, I think, is allergic to chronological order. And that's not a complaint. The man's a freaking genius. Uh, but um, I was very confused at points. And honestly, it's a time in our history I know really well. Uh, what helped was they would kind of keep telling you their names. Oh, Herr Frommenheimer. You know, and you'd be like, oh, right, that's who that is. Uh, and even like Kenneth Branagh's character, who was really important, but in a tiny way, right? He was very rarely in it. But every time he came in, it was super important. And you'd be like, wait, who is that? And he'd always say, I just came from Belgium. You know, you're like, oh, yeah, yeah, I remember. Uh, so it's just kind of funny. They try to help you. Um... You know, basically what you need to know is quite simply, um, Americans weren't doing any physics like this. Uh, and Oppenheimer was the guy who brought what all the Europeans were doing over to America. And as we progressed into war with the Nazis... Come Holy Spirit. I guess the best way to put it is everybody started rushing because they knew we could turn this into a bomb. They just didn't know how. There were so many practical considerations. There were so many, and I don't understand the science. I'm super ignorant on science. But in the end, it's a race. Is Hitler going to have the first one or are we? Um, and that involved us helping scientists sneak out of Europe and become Americans, guys like Einstein. Uh, you know, you had what, Enrique Fermi, you had uh, Einstein, you had uh, Oppenheimer, obviously. But even like Einstein didn't want anything to do with that. Uh, and none of them really did. That was the curious part that I thought the movie captured well. The reality of someone's going to build it and we'd rather a, a republic did than a dictatorship, especially one run by a guy named Adolf Hitler or Joseph Stalin. Um, so they had to build it in their minds. In their minds, they had to build it. And I think tactically they were right. The problem is you can't unbuild it once you do. Um, you can't just have one atomic bomb and then everybody says, oh, we can do it. You also have the issue of... They wanted to know. And that was a big thing. Can we do this? But then all of it tempered by the realization, we are creating a weapon that could end the world. And not end the world like, you know, they. and I'm glad they did this. Like there was always this story, oh, Oppenheimer knew the earth could blow up if he really, or believed. No, not really. When they did the math, there was no way. It wasn't going to ignite the atmosphere. But when they talked about we could be ending the world, what they were talking about is we you can't put it back in the box you, you just can't um like there was a book written by uh tom clancy called the sum of all fears okay don't see the movie it sucked uh the book is unspeakably good but a big plot line is, it, is terrorists building a nuclear weapon. Not an atomic weapon, a nuclear weapon. Um, oh, and to give you a sense of things, true. The U.S. arsenal of nuclear weapons doesn't have a bomb as small as the one we dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. We don't make bombs that small anymore. Which, holy crap. But anyway, in the book, Clancy step-by-step... Detail by detail had them building the bomb such that when he finished it, the CIA visited his house. How did you figure out how to build a nuclear bomb? And he said, the library. Right. He effectively learned how to build a nuclear bomb by reading. So. The scientists building it knew that day would come, right? And that we'd get better and better and better at this. But they couldn't stop themselves because of intellectual curiosity. Um, but also the abject conviction, someone's going to build one. I hope it's us. I hope we get there first. And don't forget, like when World War II was over, 
General MacArthur was pushing for an invasion of the Soviet Union. And some of that is, of course, the strong and appropriate, if you ask me, fear of communism. But also, they're the only ones left who could still build one. Let's just end the threat of nuclear war right frickin' now. Right? Wasn't that MacArthur Pot or was that Eisenhower? Do you remember? There was a strong push in the U.S. military leadership. Forgive the, this how I'm putting it. We're here in Europe. <laughs> right? We're already here. The Soviet Union is beaten down. And they're the only ones who could do it now. Let's burn them to the ground. I know Patton. Patton. Oh, Patton wanted to invade everybody. Yeah. Especially yeah. Okay, Patton, MacArthur, uh, and we're not sure about Eisenhower. Uh, and that the movie captures that well, I think, very subtly, this idea of every once in a while, you can see any given scientist stop and think, what are we doing? But they're also powerless to stop. If we don't build it, someone will. Better a rep republic has it. Um, does that... Yeah, so back to the movie. Oh, sorry, Seth. No, not okay. at all. Not at all. I th that was great. Um, what's your review of the movie? What would you rate it? Mm. I do want to be clear that I, I wish they wouldn't have had uh, the nudity. It, it did not feel helpful or important. It didn't feel childish, right? I, like It wasn't like, well, we better get some sex in here, but... I don't know. Uh, but anyway, uh, I was blown away by the movie. Um, even the way, and Nolan is the king of this. They used sound. Uh, and again, I'll be honest. I saw it at the theater, which meant I couldn't hear. I need subtitles. So I probably caught half of the dialogue at most. Right? I'll watch it when it comes out on, what do you call it? Because then I can watch with, what do you call them? Subtitles. But. Uh, and that's a tough thing about being hearing impaired, right? Uh, I can't really watch movies at the theater unless it's a dumb action movie where I don't need to know there's dialogue, right? You know, uh, let's go get them. It's really easy to read lips. But they used sound really well to convey the mess of his head, um, the chaos in his mind, um, and I, I like, I appreciate that sort of thing. Um, they avoided the whole, he is a good guy. He is a bad guy. This was just, this was these people's wrestling, um, with wrestling with their conscience, wrestling with what they're capable of, uh, all those kind of things. Um, I, I, I enjoyed it and I learned a lot and I know it wasn't totally historically correct, uh, but how do you do something that complicated correctly? Yeah. Although, have you spoken to Greg? Um, yeah. He said that it was very yeah. accurate. Yeah. Oh, I mean, um, the whole thing of uh, the way they went after him. Uh, you know, I don't want to give anything away. Sure. Um, a lot of it was around perceived Jewishness. Okay. There was a ton of anti-Semitism. Uh, in that um yeah oh thanks okay mark eastwood this is super helpful we've got a comment from mark eastwood quote easterwood. sorry, sorry? Easterwood. oh i see i'm sorry thank you mark mark easterwood quote an atomic bomb is a form of a nuclear bomb i think you're thinking of an hydrogen bomb and i was i'm very grateful for that correction and to be clear when I say I was thinking of it, I still didn't know what you just shared with us, so I'm really grateful. Uh, okay, I always thought it was, there's atomic bombs, there's nuclear bombs, and there's uh, thermonuclear, which are the uh, hydrogen, and I didn't get that the first two are basically the same. Gotcha. So, way to go, bro. Er, right, bro? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Next question. Uh, next question. America's rage, Americans rage after Pearl Harbor versus our rage after the 9-11 attacks. Was there a difference in the amount of rage? Oh, absolutely. As I read it, like, guys, I'm going to be blunt. I don't know if you remember. The first few days after the attacks, as soon as the dust settled, we got right back into the practice of hating on each other and blaming each other. Do you remember all this? 
uh, like within a week, a professor at Harvard had said, yeah, we deserved this. We brought this on ourselves. Um, there is seems no limit to Americans' self-loathing. Uh, it, it really is shocking. Uh, no, no, this went from, what was the stat I read you? I can't remember the exact, but what, 78% of Americans were opposed to entry into World War II on December 6th, 1941, and everybody was on board. And they weren't the kind of on-board Americans are now. And again, I'm not ripping on us. This is just how we are, where we have the attention span of a gnat. Uh, this was five years of focused, channeled rage. Um, like you watch the old clips of them building tanks right here in Flint, and they're writing things on the side of the tanks, right, uh, to let the Japanese know. Uh, even the tanks that were going to Europe, right? Like this was... And again, 9-11 can't compare because I don't know how... Do you mind looking this stat up? I'm so sorry, bro. U.S. population in 1941. Uncle Chuck's going to look this up, okay? But basically, we lost 3,000 Americans at Pearl Harbor in 1941. Uh, our population in 1941 was... 133 million. We are three times that population now, and we lost basically the same number of people. Think about that. So for World Trade Center terrorist attack to equal what that one did, 12,000 dead. Right, in terms of population impact. Yeah. Um, we just can't sustain that kind of hate anymore because half of it is you have a chunk of America that hates America so badly, right? You have a chunk of America that may not hate America but can't not criticize it. And you have a chunk of America that if we went down and, you know, invaded Canada for no reason would justify it, right? You've got all these cliques that are more interested in hating each other than in loving the country, uh, back then, you basically had two parties, and they actually represented consistent political uh, ideology rather than, well, if the Democrats say this, then I'm going to say the opposite. If the Republicans say that, then I'm going to say the opposite. Right? There were things, if a Democrat did something stupid, Democrats and Republicans yelled at them. Right? If a Republican did something stupid, Democrats and Republicans yelled at them. It's just, we don't do that anymore. Um, yeah. Uh, okay, so I should probably get to some content. I see another question, and if you don't object, I would love to get to that tomorrow. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay, great. So for the person who asked about Angels of Bataan, I, I would like to hop on that tomorrow if you don't mind. I hope you don't mind. Nope. Uh, and even if you do, I made my decision. How did that sound? Did I sound really tough? You, you can tell me yes now. So when last we left the war, uh, oh, and I do have to end early today. Sorry about that. Will you help me remember, sis? I will. Okay. Uh, Carrie killed someone. I got to go uh, help her with her alibi. Please don't tell anyone I said that. Uh, especially like if a law enforcement officer comes by, here's your line. I have no knowledge of anything, Senator. <laughs> So what we've got, when last we left off the war in the Pacific, it is not an exaggeration to say the U.S. and Britain got their clocks cleaned. Japan swept through the Pacific, and it wasn't even that close. There wasn't a point where it looked like the U.S. could win any of these individual battles. And the U.S., learned a lot. One, this is an incomprehensible enemy to us. The willingness to die, the willingness to do crazy things by our standards, right? Like I told you about how many, and you can read a million books and find all these stories of these American guys in their foxholes with their rifles out, and all of a sudden, 
a Japanese soldier appears falling into their foxhole and stabbing them, right? They, and American men weren't really trained for hand-to-hand like the Japanese were. For the Japanese, hand-to-hand was very important. Uh, many of their charges, and this is a day of where everybody had guns, their commander, they carried a sword, right? Uh, this was the way they thought. Um, we were cut off from all supplies. So we talked about in the Philippines that the American, Australian, and Filipino soldiers hadn't eaten in days uh, at the final attack, right? Uh, the Japanese swept through the Pacific and were not stopped. Um, we talked about how the Americans kind of just threw a screw you attack, uh, led by uh, a guy named Doolittle, and they ran a one way mission bombing. Uh, a one way, uh, it was for all intents and purposes a suicide mission. Uh, although many of them lived, like I told you, I think that they landed in China and they joined the Chinese resistance and fought till the end of the war, right? Um, where we bombed Tokyo. Right by launching bombers from an aircraft carrier, which was thought undoable. Uh, but you know, you talk about the level of rage. This was there. Imagine a standard American soldier today, who says, "You know what? Our first attack should be a suicide run." That's how furious Americans were, uh, and they did. They had no shortage of volunteers. Right? Doolittle talked about how we had to say, "No, I'm sorry, you can't go." Right. Um, so that's where we left off. Um, and that what was the strategic importance of that bombing of Tokyo? None. Uh, we didn't do much damage. Uh, and we lost all the bombers that went on the raid. Okay. So why do it? The psychological damage was extreme. Japan had been at war for years at this point. They subjugated Korea. They subjugated a whole chunk of China, uh, Laos, Cambodia. But nobody had ever got to their homeland before. Um, And it freaked them out. And they pulled ships out uh, of their perimeter and put them next to home. Not many, but enough where it made a difference later. And today we're going to hit the first battle where it made a difference. Um, One interesting thing, one of you sent me this, and I'd never seen it before, uh, but I checked it, and it's solid. Yamamoto, the Japanese admiral, who was in charge of the Pacific, right? Tojo was in charge of the whole banana, but Yamamoto was in charge of the uh, Pacific theater. Um, He said that's what they would do. He said six months after our attack on Pearl Harbor we will sweep through Pacific with no resistance. After that is where we find out what's going on. I mean, he said it better than that. But that was fascinating. I did not know that. So now we're to May of 1942. So, and again, you may remember, I told you, I'm doing sweeping things here. I'm not going step by step because, my Lord, you know, we'd be here forever. The war took a while. But for since December of last year, the U.S. has been in a war and has won nothing and lost everything. But uh, when you get to May 4th, it begins a four-day battle called the Battle of the Coral Sea. And that's what we're going to hit quickly here. It was significant. Because the point was they had to stop Japan from locking down Australia. Australia was the only means by which the U.S. could supply its fleet on that side of the world. Right? Uh, And that battle at Coral Sea was a hard-fought and long one. It was four days. Uh, Japan won militarily in the sense that it sunk more of our ships and ins- inflicted a ton of damage on us. But where we won tactically is the Japanese and us retreated at the same time. Both sides had just pounded each other, and Japan 
and this is key, didn't achieve her tactical goal, and that was the first time since the war started in 1937 that a Japanese advance was turned back. Think of that. Almost, let me see, seven, three, five years of war. Japan had not um, been turned, and a Japanese advance had not been turned back. They were freight training everybody. Um, and again, what makes this battle important, beyond what I've already said, Japan lost ships that would have helped her in the next battle. So twice, Japan has ships they could have used later that they couldn't because either they were lost at Coral Sea or they were up by Japan in case we decide to do a little how you doing again. Okay. Um, and that's where we get to Midway. Okay, the Battle of Midway. Um, and I'm going to take a drink real quick here. Um, there is a movie just called Midway, and it came out in the last few years. Do you know when that came out, Uncle Chuck? I'm sorry. Poor Uncle Chuck. Um, I recommend it. It's fantastic. And what I saw was real, or what I remember at least, it was very accurate. 2019. So this movie came out in 2019, and it's just called Midway. Um, and I thought they did a fantastic job. And part of it for me, and I cried, um, I wept at the dive bombers at Midway, right? Just the, the courage and the crazy, um, you may remember I taught you about dive bombers, right? Do I need to go through that again or do we have it? I think we have it. But you'll also, well, don't get into it. So if you get a chance, if you like war movies, this is a fine movie. Um, and I highly recommend it. But uh, I spent a lot of time on this because it is an immensely complicated battle. And I think I've come up with a way to summarize it in about two paragraphs. And I'm so terribly proud of myself. Um, so Admiral Yamamoto developed a plan and for him this battle determines whether japan survives or not to be clear and what he understood more or less us too we are out of ships right we are in so much trouble at this point so he developed a plan where he was going to lure the u.s into a battle that the U.S. would force them to sue for peace, right? And you remember, they have a plan. They sue for peace. Okay, you can have all this. We're keeping this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, and now we're done. Shake hands, right? His goal was this kind of diversion attack and a surprise attack that would take out the U.S. air position at Midway and allow them to land a bunch of troops there. And that, you know, his hope was that when I do this, then the U.S. fleet's going to leave Pearl Harbor, the, the part that's still at Pearl Harbor, to retake what we took, and then we're going to be lying in wait for them. So that's, as e that's the best I can do at explaining this plan. It's complicated, but they love complicated, and they excel at it. So the whole idea is we're going to stage we're going to stage an attack, and then when the U.S., we're going to plant ships along the route that the U.S. ships will take to come end that attack. And we'll sink them before they even get there. Does that make sense? Okay. There was a problem for the Japanese. Okay. Our code breakers figured out how to read their mail, in a sense. Our U.S. code breakers figured out the Japanese code. And this happened to Japan a lot. Okay, you hear a lot about Enigma and the Polish uh, mathematicians who figured it out and all those things, how hard it was to break the Nazi codes. Turns out it wasn't so tough to break the Japanese ones. I mean, it was tough, but it was doable. We did it a bunch of times. For most of the war, we're reading their mail in a sense. Okay, So the code breakers figured out how to read it. And Yamamoto then, so now they know his plan. Now they know how to break it. Um, the key to breaking the plan 
was for the U.S. ships to enter, enter the battle before the Japanese were ready to, before this trap was sprung. And that's what they did. So what did we have going for us? We knew what they were going to do. And they didn't know we knew. Right? We had that going for us. But guys, their ships were so vastly superior to ours. Their bombs were so much better than ours. Our torpedo planes, um, like there's one, and again, I'm sorry, I can never remember the name of all these books. But one of our torpedo ships in this battle, right? So that's the plane that flies real low. They've got a 19-foot-long a torpedo packed with 500 pounds of TNT and you just fly that plane as low as you can and then you drop it and take off and that torpedo rams into the boat and blows up. Uh, one, of the, one of the first waves of attack, the pilot said, we didn't scratch the paint, right? Our weapons were not very effective against Japanese armor, okay? So... It's still a situation where Japan has a distinct advantage. Their ships are so much better than ours. And by the way, they had all their best ones here. Okay, the Yamato, and I can never remember the name of the other one, the sister ship they built for the Yamato. Um, The Yamato was a ship the Japanese built uh, that was so far advanced, it was more advanced than anything the Brits, the Nazis, or the Americans had. And it was a world of difference. And she had a sister ship that I want to say Fuji, but I, I'm pretty sure I'm wrong. Okay. Um, do you, would you mind looking yeah, that up? The Yamato sister ship. Musashi? Oh, Musashi. Okay. Musashi was the greatest samurai who ever lived in Japanese history, right? He was one of the only samurai who fought two-handed. He, had, he, he could fight with two swords. Cool stuff. Anyway, uh, so they named uh, Yamato, which was the name of the Japanese spirit, right? They called them, they had the Yamato spirit. So that's what they named uh, the first one after. The second one they named after the greatest samurai who ever lived. Uh, although Yuki Omishima would disagree. He would say he was the greatest samurai who ever lived. Where? Uh, Nagasaki, I'd assume. Yeah, they, that's why we picked Nagasaki. Yeah, it was where they were building stuff, you know. Um, so what do we? What happened? The Americans fought with insane determination and a willingness to take heavy casualties. Okay, uh, the dive bombers in particular who suffered unspeakable losses, just kept coming and coming. It was, in many ways, the U.S. Navy's finest hour, right? Uh, Guys, just think of this. Here's what you know. My job is to drop a bomb on this ship, and I know it's not going to do much. And I do it anyway. Because I know if we just keep doing this, it'll eventually work. And by the way, every time you run that mission, you're probably going to get shot. Right? Um, the Japanese, for the first time, encountered Americans who chose death rather than surrender. So, for example, one of the planes that was shot down, one of the, not dive bombers, the other kind, the torpedo planes, they actually captured the crew. Um, who then chose death rather than to share information, right? Or to be taken prisoners. Um, just, it's just what Yamamoto said. You poked the bear, right? Now the bear's awake. Um, and the Americans fought insane. What was their hope at the beginning of the battle, the American hope? The goal was, can we sink one of their aircraft carriers? Okay, they did not succeed in sinking one. They sunk four. Now, again, remember, it takes years to build an aircraft carrier if you're not America. right? And Japan has her little equation And they had no equation for losing four carriers, let alone four in one battle. Does that make sense? The end of this battle, 
The Japanese lost four aircraft carriers. The American goal was one. They lost one heavy cruiser. They had one heavy cruiser damaged and it had to be towed. They lost two destroyers. They lost 250 airplanes and 3,000 Japanese sailors were, ca- were killed. A little over 3,000. Um, the Japanese pulled back. The American forces suffered horrific losses. Uh, but these losses were on the offensive side of the battle. They just, Americans just kept attacking and attacking. Um, And they were attacking smart. Our bombs and ships, I wrote this, were challenging at best, right? To give you a sense of things, by the way, all those ships that they sunk in Pearl Harbor, this is how behind we were, right? All those ships they sunk in World War II, uh, Pearl Harbor, they were all World War I ships. We hadn't built any since then, any of note. Right, the ships they sunk in Pearl Harbor were built during World War One. Uh, but even with that, the Navy's answer was, "Then we're just gonna keep coming." And the American victory at Midway was as total and devastating uh, as you can imagine. And this was the beginning of the end of the Japanese in the Pacific War. I think it was Nimitz who said, "When we are finished with them." The only place where people will be speaking Japanese is in hell, right? That was Admiral Nimitz. Uh, So that's bad enough, right? If you're Japan, you lost four ships when your mathematical equation, and you lost them in one battle, was that you weren't going to lose four in the war. Uh, But not only that, things were going south for the Nazis for the first time. Uh, in the European offensive, the Nazi offensive, in the European theater, the Nazi offensive started to falter. Supply lines were stretched beyond what they could do. And again, Hitler made a profoundly bad strategical decision in attacking the Soviet Union. And then he made another one in not giving up. Uh, he couldn't supply his own people well. And the Soviets were doing what communists do, just throw people at it. Um, You may remember, I think I told you, Stalin's orders, when they said, well, what are your orders for the defense of the city? Not one step backward. That was his order. That was the strategy. Um, They literally had people, the only ones with loaded guns, were behind the other Soviet soldiers shooting anyone who went backward. Uh, uh, this was, yeah, so the Nazi uh, Nazis, the winter wiped them out, supply lines are a mess, and they just were freight trained by the Soviets, who then started punching back, moving away from defensive warfare to offensive warfare. Um, now, at this point, guys, there was no one alive who saw the possibility of Japan winning the war. Okay, the U.S. could rebuild ships at a rate that was simply alarming to the world and that Japan couldn't touch. Um, uh, Japan simply couldn't afford to lose any aircraft carriers, let alone four. Japan had hundreds of thousands of troops bogged down in China. She was stretched all over the Pacific, occupying lands and fighting now to take the one she hadn't occupied completely. She had minimum resources coming in and none leaving. And that's probably the place to stop, right? Because we do have to, and I'm so sorry, guys. I hope you don't feel, uh, well, I don't care how you feel. No, uh, I got a meeting and we couldn't, I can't be late to it. Uh, it's, this is where we talk to Carrie, guys, about her drinking. So uh, please don't tell her this is uh, an intervention. Yeah. We actually started getting thank you letters from different vodka co- companies all over the country addressed directly to Carrie. So uh, we will wrap this up because last time we left the Americans in a happier spot. So let's leave Japan in a bad spot, huh? <laughs> and uh, when we return, I, I think you'll find this helpful. Uh, you know, again, just keep in mind that great Dan Carlin quote. I just love this quote. The Japanese are like everyone else, only more so. 
proof that this in is really what we're going to get into. I'm going to give you a snapshot of what the average Japanese person was thinking. Uh, a snapshot of what was going on in America if you were Japanese. Hint, it's not good. Um, and we'll take some of this apart. So I really do appreciate you guys. Uh, so many of you are enjoying this, and that just makes my day. I've shared with you before, I get nervous uh, when I talk, don't talk about Jesus in our podcast. I do. I, I want you to know Jesus. I want you to love him, and I want you to let him love you. Um, but I think this is helpful information. And, you know, remember, we're the only things God made that can learn for no reason. Right? Think about it. it. It's really cool to think about. So every time you and I grow in knowledge of anything, we're being more human. And human's good. When God made humans, he went, hey, that's good. Right? Okay, so tomorrow is question and answer, and then I'll tackle any of your questions about our material so far, and then any other questions you have. We do only have, that I remember, two or three questions lined up for tomorrow. Uh, so um, don't hesitate to submit your questions. Uh, we'd be excited to get after them. Okay, so this is Thursday. So tomorrow's question and answer, and uh, I guess that's all I have to say. I feel like I'm forgetting something. Oh, should I tell them about my great purchase or should I wait till tomorrow? tomorrow. Okay, tomorrow I'll tell you about my big purchase. I'll give you a hint. It costs money. <laughs> money I took from Chuck. All right, salad pray. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, when we're tempted to compromise a bit on a sin, Help us to remember that sin doesn't stop on its own. That when we look at the violence that we're learning about today and the bad decisions, the bad decisions came from a lifetime of giving in to sin. Hmm? And what we want, Lord, is your help in winning the battle in our heart to always choose virtue, to always obey you, to sacrifice, to be humble, to be who you've called us to be. We have a part to play in this universe you've created, Lord. Help us to play it faithfully and well and to trust that the fruit of that is life, not death. All over the world, there are people who are victims of warfare, and we ask that you comfort them, Lord. We ask that you deliver them. We ask that you stop the Russian invasion of Ukraine and deliver those people from war. We ask that you stop the violence in Africa as Catholics are killed and imprisoned and driven from their land. We ask that you protect all your children in Central America. We ask for the grace to never repay evil with evil. Heavenly Father, you know the people we love and worry about. And you know all the circumstances in our lives that cause us to fret. And we give all of it to you, Lord, because we love you and we trust you. And may Almighty God bless you all. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. My kung fu is strong. I will see you beautiful people tomorrow. And until then, frozen peas are my gift to you.